Okay, this week we're going to um, we're going to continue on our study on the second coming. I I didn't get anywhere near as far as I thought I would last week, and I don't know how far I'll get this week. I'm just going to go until we run out of time, um, and because it's not the type of subject that we need to rush through, we can we can take our time with this one. When the day when it gets here, then it'll be nice to know all of these things. And if he comes before I finish it. Well, that'll be okay, too. I don't have a problem with that. Last week, we, we covered some ground. We looked, at the, uh, we looked at how important it is to understand that the powers of darkness absolutely hate this doctrine. This is, the do this is a position that gives us our hope. As Paul said, that if, if we trust in Christ only in this world, we are, are of all men most miserable. It is the second coming of Christ when we are taken out of this sin-cursed planet, never to come back here again. That is the hope that we have. When you close your eyes and sleep and go to sleep at night, I trust that you're thinking that if he were to return then, then all of your problems are behind you. That if you don't wake up tomorrow because Christ returns tonight, then all the suffering that you've ever done is behind you. And that is a hope that we can latch on to and hang on to um, and, and one that, will, that should give us a great deal of joy. It's also the doctrine that provoked the Jewish council to call for the death of, of Christ. We saw that last week at the, over in Matthew 26, 63. Um, we also noticed in John 14 that Christ promised that he would come again. That was a promise made by Christ to us. We saw that his going into heaven was vis visible, and that it was bodily, and that his return will be exactly the same way, that when he returns it's not going to be a secret. Um, I think it was Harold Camping that had predicted that he would return on May 25th, 2012, something like that, and, and when it didn't happen, he said, well, it was a spiritual return, okay? Um, the preterists, those that believe that all of the prophecy wrapped up in 70 AD, teach that he returned in a spiritual sense. Um, this is not going to be a spiritual return. This is going to be a visible return and a bodily return, and it will be a return where everyone that has ever lived on this planet will witness it. This will be the crowning event of history when Christ returns, and we covered those points last week. Um, we showed that all the enemies of Christ and his church will be put under his feet at, at this point, the last enemy to be destroyed being death, we showed that God's elect will be raised in glorified bodies and will be in the, with the Lord in glory. We also showed that the wicked will be raised at this same appearing. Everybody comes up at the same time. There's not a seven year or a thousand and seven year lag between two resurrections. There is a resurrection, a singular resurrection, both of the just and of the unjust. The only difference is that the just will leave the ground and go to God to go to be with Christ in glory while the wicked will just stay here and receive the wrath of God that's just coming upon them. We showed that the present heavens and earth will be destroyed at this time, that Christ will judge all men, 
um, the righteous will be rewarded, the wicked will be punished, and that this will mark the last day of time. Now those are the things that we looked at last week. We want to begin this week by looking at some of the things that the second coming is called in Scripture because it's referred to in a number of different ways. And so it's important to know that when you read this, oh, okay, that's referring to the second coming. It doesn't say second coming, but it's called a bunch of different things. And so I want to show you some of these things that make reference to that day. In fact, that day is one of them. Um, I think it's the last one on my list, but, but that's one of them. When you read that, and, and as you go through, especially when we get into the Olivet Discourse, I've talked to, I talked a little bit about that last week. When we get to that and we go through that prophecy, you're going to see a marked difference between that day and another bunch of days that are jumbled up together. You will see it. You'll see a very sharp contrast because that day refers to the second coming where those days refers to something else. Okay. The first one we want to look at is found over in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10 where we read, but the day of the Lord. Now this is one of the references to the second coming, the day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now let me ask you a question. If all of this is going to happen on the day of the Lord, where would the millennial reign be? The premillennial dispensationalists teach that he will return and set up a temple in Jerusalem, or that there will be a temple in Jerusalem for him to reign from for a thousand years. Now, if at the day of the Lord, which comes as a thief in the night, the heavens pass away with a great noise, that's the Big Bang, by the way, in case you haven't caught it. There's the big bang right, right there. Pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Where are you going to have a millennial reign? There's not going to be anything left. When Christ returns, it's over with. The elements shall melt. You know what elements are? I'm not real good. I wasn't real good with science, but the elements are like atoms. The things that atoms, where you have a nucleus and you've got electrons floating around them. Well, if those melt, there's nothing left. Everything will be gone. There's nowhere for them to have any kind of a thousand year reign. So keep that in mind. Remember, you know, one of the, keep your finger here and turn over to Matthew chapter 24. One of the things that, um, one of the things that I was actually blessed with in my prior life was the business that I ended up with in. I was a real estate appraiser, as you all know. Um, and I ro rose through the ranks of that, of, of that profession because I was very serious about doing it the right way. It was important to me to do what I did the way you're supposed to do it. Now, a real estate appraiser is supposed to take data and compare data without any preconceived ideas, without any preconceived notions, but simply take data and compare it and reach a conclusion based on that data of what the data is saying. And then if what your conclusion matches with the number that people are, are looking for, well then that's good. But if it doesn't, then it doesn't. But that's what appraisers are supposed to do. Do you see a parallel between that that I was trained for 22 years in and what I do today is there I still look at data only it's called verses and I compare verses in one place with verses in another place the same way that I did as an appraiser without any preconceived conclusions or notions and that's where most people get hung up when they're studying the Bible because they like I said in that essential Bible doctrine series people have these preconceived ideas of what the Bible is going to teach and so they'll look at a verse and then try to twist the verse a little bit to make it fit their preconceived notions 
That's what they do. They get this idea in their mind, well, there has to be this millennial reign. So they ignore places where it talks about when Christ returns is going to destroy everything because that doesn't fit their preconceived notion. That's no different than a real estate appraiser looking at the sales price on a house and then asking the question, how do I justify the sales price? It's the same thing. And that's not what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to look at this with, without any preconceived ideas and then study the Bible based on that. And that's what I'm trying to give you in this series. Let's, let's wipe all that preconceived stuff out and let's just look at what the verses say and what the data tells us and reach our conclusions based on that. And if those preconceived ideas fall by the wayside, then so be it. They should. If they don't line up with the Bible, remember we're to prove all things, hold fast that which is good. If those preconceived ideas are not good, if they're not truth, we need to get rid of them. And so that's why I want you to understand that's really what I'm doing with all of these. So we've already looked at the fact that you're, we're not going to have some thousand year reign on a planet that doesn't exist anymore. Where would you have it? Okay. Now I, I asked you to turn to Matthew chapter 24 because I want, I want you to see something. We saw in over here in Peter where it talks about the day of the Lord. Day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Okay. Now we have a parable that Christ taught over in Matthew chapter 24. In verses 43 and 44 it says, But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come. You see that? The day of the Lord is coming as a thief in the night. Now we have a parable about a thief and watching for a thief had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. You see, when we start talking about this thief in the night, that's exactly how you are to watch for him. The day of the Lord will come when no one expects it to happen. So Christians need to be on the lookout constantly for it. You never know when it's going to happen. You, there's no way to know. There are no signs. There is no way to know when this is going to happen. It is just going to happen. So we have to be on watch for it. We have to keep our eyes open. We have to constantly live as if tomorrow is the day or today is the day so that we don't get out of line and don't start doing things thinking, oh, I got plenty of time, I don't have to worry about that for five years, I got plenty of time. It's not going to happen now. It could. It could. And that should keep us walking circumspect, knowing that at any moment Christ could return. Right? Now, one, a, a few weeks ago, I preached on the guidelines for Christian living, and the last one of them was what? Would I want to be doing this when Christ returns? So, whatever it is you're doing, is it something that you would be happy about if, if Christ returned right then? And remember, he could. Keep that always in front of your thoughts, Keep that always in front of the things that you decide you want to do with your life. Make sure that whatever it is that you're doing, that you would not be ashamed if he returned today or if he returned in the middle of that activity, whatever it is. Okay. So the day of the Lord. Notice both of these, both of these deal with the, the day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, both of those terms, and they both deal with him with a thief. They're both talking about a thief in the night. And the day of the Lord is the day when he comes. Okay? Another term that is referred to in the scripture is found over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And this is the day of Christ. Paul's talking about well, let's look at verse 1 to get the context. Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, 
that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us as the day of Christ is at hand. You see the day of Christ. When you see that in the scriptures, pay attention. It's talking about the second coming. Let's look at another one. The day of our Lord Jesus Christ over in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1 and verse 8. Who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? Now, keep your finger here and go back over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 again. Or, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And verse 23. And watch what Paul says. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here we have Paul praying that these people will be blameless unto the coming of Christ. And in another passage, he says, Who shall confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's talking about the same thing. When Christ comes, that's the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul prays that your whole spirit and soul and body will be preserved blameless. Okay? That's the, that's the nature of man. That's one of the verses where we conclude that man has three parts to himself. Spirit, soul, and body. We are, we are a trichotomous uh, creation. It's amazing at how many trinities there are. How many three things there are out there and man is made up of three parts and in the new birth your spirit and your soul are changed but your body just remains here until you're until it's resurrected out of the grave okay it doesn't get changed until then so we see God's people will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ and also the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ so therefore the day of our Lord Jesus Christ is the day of his coming okay the next is found over in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 and it is known as the day of redemption Ephesians 4 and verse 30 and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption to redeem something is to go pick it up. Something that you've already paid for that you now go pick up. If you, let's say you pawn something and you get a little ticket on it. When you go back in and you pay the price for it, you redeem that item. You pick up that item that belongs to you. You've paid the price for it, you pick it up and you redeem it. Okay, that's what redemption is. Christ paid the price for us on the cross. Our spirit and soul have already been redeemed, but our body hasn't. The day of redemption is when he comes back to collect those bodies, to make all of his people whole once again. That's the day of redemption. It's the day of the second coming. It's the day of the resurrection. Okay? Look also at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. You see, this, this day of redemption, we're dealing with the body. The spirit and the soul have already been changed, but not our bodies. They won't be changed until the day of redemption or the day of the resurrection. Look at Luke chapter 21.
Luke chapter 21 and verse 27 says, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. That means it's, it's close. It's getting closer. And this will be the time that the prayer of Psalms 25, 22 will be fully answered. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all of his troubles. This will be the second coming. Now there's another phrase that, that, that we for, refer to as the day of God over in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12. Where we read, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein, now watch again what's going to happen on this day, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. You see, folks, when Christ returns, that's it. It's over, done, finished, kaput. There's nothing left. He's going to burn this place up. It's going to dissolve. It will not be here any longer. And this is one of the, this is one of the interesting things when you think about, and I know I'm going to get a little far afield here, but when you think about hell, there, there are people that don't like the idea of hell. You realize that's a temporary abode? That's a temporary holding place for the wicked? That if you die and go to hell, it's in the middle of the earth. It's a temp, but it's a temporary holding place. Why is it temporary? Well, because he's going to destroy the earth. So where are they going to go? Well, they're going to go to the day of judgment, and after the day of judgment, they'll be cast in the lake of fire. Now, I don't know where that lake is. I don't have any idea. No one else knows either. But those that are in hell today will be there temporarily until Christ returns. And when he returns, then they come out of there for the judgment, and then they're cast in the lake of fire. It's a different place, okay? It's just a side note. I, I, we'll, we'll get to talking about that doctrine um, downstream, but, uh, but that is something. But it's, no, it's important to notice that on this day, there's not going to be anything left here. There won't be anything left when Christ returns. He's going to return and pour out vengeance on this planet and on this universe and completely destroy it. It's not going to be here anymore. Remember that when you put all of your treasures and all of your thoughts and all of your cares and everything that you have into this world. Because when Christ returns, he thinks so much of it that he's just going to burn it up and destroy it. That's why he says, put your treasures in heaven where moth and rust will not destroy them. Don't put them into this earth. Because someday he's going to return. And when he does, if you're standing here, everything that you put all your hopes and dreams into, you will watch be destroyed as you leave. Now, you won't care. You'll be happy to leave. But you understand the point? Okay. The next one is found in Romans chapter 2. And this ties right in with what we've been talking about. The day when Christ returns, I want you to see the language that the Apostle Paul used to describe this in Romans chapter 2 and verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath, against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now he's talking about the non-elect. He's talking about the wicked here. Not talking about the saints. That's not who he's speaking to. Okay, so pay attention to who it is he's talking to. But notice, for you it will be a glorious event. For God's children it will be a glorious event. We will get out of this sin-cursed place. But look at what happens to the others. What is, to us, we call it the day of the Lord, the second coming, the day of our redemption. To them, it is the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. The day when God settles all the scores. The day when God gets even. Okay? He doesn't get mad 
but he gets even. And this will be the day of the revelation of him as well as, as the wrath of God upon this sin-cursed planet and what they've done. Look at Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 verse 31. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness, by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. You see, it's Jesus Christ that will be the one that judges the world. Both the righteous and the unrighteous. He's the judge. And he is the one that was ordained for that on that specific day. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Second Timothy 4 and verse 1 says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So the same time as his appearing, when he returns, that's when the judgment's going to happen. Do you see how all these events all come in together? He returns, he destroys the world, he raises both the, both the just and the wicked. The, the just are caught up to meet him in the air. The wicked stay here, they destroys the planet, and then judgment day, and then that's the end. You see how all that just kind of fits together? If you, if you remove all of the preconceived ideas of what's going to happen. Let's look at another one, Matthew chapter 11. And remember, on the one side, we have, we have the just. We have the children of God. To them, this is a gloriful day. This is the day they've been looking for their entire lives. But just picture what it is to those that don't believe in Christ. Picture to those that have rejected Christ. Picture what they'll be thinking when he returns. That oops moment that I talked about last week. This is a big oops on their part. Matthew chapter 11, verse 21. Woe unto thee, Chor Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Now you remember what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember that he rained fire and brimstone on it and completely destroyed it in one day. You remember that. And yet it will be more tolerable for what they went through. That would be light duty compared to what's going to happen to the rest of the world and to the wicked on the day of judgment when it's all over with. You picture Sodom and Gomorrah. You picture that city of nothing but ash now sitting out south of Jerusalem. And that is the easy case compared to what's going to happen to the rest of this place. Think about that. He completely incinerated that city instantly by raining fire and brimstone on it and destroyed everybody that was in it. But it's still there. To this day, it is still there. When he returns... There's going to be nothing left. So you can see how that was the easy case. What's coming on this earth is going to be the hard case. And like I said, he can slow things down to the point to where, where you might think it lasts an eternity and it's only five minutes. Now luckily... I don't think we have anyone in the room that has to concern themselves with that side of the equation. But it's important to know that that side of the equation is out there. 
I want you to turn also to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Well, let's, let's go up a little bit, just for the context. Well, no, let's just start at 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. He knows how to take care of you, and he knows how to take care of them. So you have nothing to fear. If you're one of God's children, you have nothing to worry about in this. You'll be able to sit back and look at it and watch what's going on. But for those that are not one of God's children, it's not going to be a pleasant day when he returns. He's not going to come back and beg people to accept him. That's not on the plate. We don't find that anywhere in the scripture. He's not going to walk around the rim of hell crying and sobbing for those that wouldn't let him in. That's not going to happen at all. He's going to come back, grab his people out of this world, and then destroy the rest of it. Okay? Look also at 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Think about this when you hear the when you hear about all the global warming talk and how we're so, how we're destroying the planet, we're ruining it, and it's not going to be here for our children. God's going to make sure that it's here until He returns. He promised as much over in the book of Genesis that as long as there's seed time and harvest, that everything's going to just keep spinning. Things are not going to get out of hand. Man can't destroy this planet. He already did. Man destroyed this planet when Adam ate of the forbidden fruit. And it's been on a downhill cycle ever since. But it will continue to be here until Christ returns. Then God will destroy it. Man can't do any more harm to it than he's already done. God will take care of it when he returns. Okay. Next I want you to turn your attention to Jude verse 6. Jude verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. That's another term, the great day. And why would it, how, what day could be any greater than this? when Christ finally returns and settles all scores. In Revelation chapter 6 and verse 17, it says, For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So on the one hand, on the, at the great day, you have the catching up of the children of God pulled out of this planet, and at the same time we have the wrath of God poured out on the wicked. It all occurs at the same time on the, at that great day. Let's look at one more. Look at John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Verse 23. Jesus, now this is talking about Lazarus. Remember Lazarus had passed away and Christ went back and raised him, raised him up from the dead again, right? Well, before he raised him from the dead, his Lazarus' sister knew he was dead. He was in the ground. He'd been there for three days. She knew he was gone. He was toast. And Jesus says in verse 23, Thy brother shall rise again. Now, she didn't know that Christ was going to raise him. She didn't know that was the plan. But she understood doctrine better than most PhDs from Dallas Theological Seminary. Because look what she says next. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection 
at the last day. How many days are there after the last one? Primary meanings, people. Look up the word last in your dictionary and see what it says. The last day is the last day, and that's when the resurrection takes place. The last day, and even Martha knew that much. Let's look at another. Well, we've already we've already looked at some verses. Let me John chapter 6 and verse 39. We'll go through these again just to make the point because this is this is one that people seem to miss. They seem to forget about this one and then come up with all kinds of ideas and and I'm sorry but until you can convince me that there's time between the last day there can't be time between it if something happens at the end well it happens at the end it doesn't happen in the middle okay John chapter 6 and verse 39 and this is the father's will which hath sent me that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing but should raise it up again at the last day you see, the resurrection will be at the last day. And we also read, or we've seen over in Corinthians, that we don't get out of here. Those that are alive don't get out of here until they're raised, until the dead are raised. Well, if the dead are raised on the last day, when do you think you're going to get out of here? You're not going before them. So you're going to be changed at the last day, and time is over. It's finished at that point. So let's not ever lose sight of that. Okay, and then we have one other term that we're going to look at, and that term is that day. Matthew chapter 24. Now I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a preview briefly of what we're going to look at when in a few weeks when we get to the Olivet Discourse. If you start in Matthew chapter 24 and you start going down through this passage, you're going to see a lot of references to plural things, plural days and plural events. These things, those days, these things, those days. I'm going to give you the heads up right now. When you see that, it's dealing, that's dealing with what was going on at the temple at that time in 70, in, well, what actually was going to happen in 70 AD and then did happen in 70 AD. So when you're reading through here and you see these plural references to the, these things in those days, that's what that's talking about. But then you get down to a passage in Matthew 24 verse 36 where there's a change. Let me give you a, let me give you a, you go to Matthew 36. I'm going to, I'm going to look here in Matthew chapter 29 just to make this point. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, you see we're talking plural. Um, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. We'll deal with that when we get to that, but I want you to understand, I want you to think about something else what's the big selling books now the blood moons or something like the four blood moons where they're talking about the the moon turning red and how that's going to signal the the uh, the tribulation period because the the signs in heaven of the moon turning blood into blood and yada 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 and that's supposed to bring about the tribulation period that's what they're saying now look at this verse again immediately after the tribulation well wait a minute that means that if, if those signs have anything to do with the tribulation period, well, the tribulation period's over. Right? Pay attention to the Bible. Don't pay attention to booksellers. Immediately after the, the tribulation of those, day, of those days, look in verse, um, uh, let's see. Look at verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When its branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when ye shall see all these things, 
know that it is dear, near even at the doors. And if you then compare that with Luke 21, 31, you're going to find out that what's near the doors is the kingdom of God. It has nothing to do with second coming. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And that generation did not pass until all those things were fulfilled. Within 40 years of Christ speaking these words, all of those things were fulfilled. Jerusalem was destroyed. The Jews were sent captive. And that's precisely what this is talking about in this passage. But now keep, keep watching. Um, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Verse 36, but of that day and hour. Do you see a difference? These days, those days, these things, those things, but of that day? You see, Christ was answering a couple of questions. One of the questions was, when is the temple going to be destroyed? And the other question was, when are you going to return? Well, he gave a bunch of signs for when the temple was going to be destroyed, because he would. His children were there. They needed to know what the signs were to get out of there to protect themselves in this life. But of that day knoweth no man. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Jesus Christ himself at that time did not know when he would return. So how in the world does somebody down here be able to pinpoint it if Christ himself doesn't know it? The only person that knows when Christ is going to return is God Almighty. Now, I'm sure he probably knows it by now, but he's not telling anybody. Okay, so that day, look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Now, this is one of the songs that we sang this morning. It's one of the reasons I picked it. For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That day, remember, but of that day knoweth no man. We're talking about the second coming of Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus thou knowest very well. And in chapter 4 and verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day. Remember one of the things that happens the righteous are judged. Well, this is the reward that he receives. That's what he's referring to. At that day, the same time, it all wraps up together. And not only to me only, but all, unto all them also that love his appearing. So if you would love his appearing, then you fall into the same crowd as the Apostle Paul. So we see that it's called by several different names. Now the next point I want to make is that the second coming is a tenet of the gospel of, the, of Jesus Christ. This is, it was the resurrection that is one of the things that the gospel was based on early by the days, by the apostles. That's what they preached on was the resurrection. Not only the resurrection of Christ, but also the resurrection of us at the end. That was a major point of the gospel. So I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to spend some time here. And let's look at the gospel itself as preached by the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. 
For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, and then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, as, as of one born out of due time. Do you see how the resurrection of Christ is the major point of the gospel? Yes, he died according to the scriptures, but he was risen again according to the scriptures. And Paul goes into great detail to point out the fact that it was the person of Christ that died. Keep your finger here because we're going to come back, but turn over to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 and verse 20. Oh, I've got the wrong verse. Chapter 18. Hate it when that happens. Well, let's go back to 1 Corinthians. I apologize for that. I've got the wrong verse written down here. So Paul, in his, in his presentation of the gospel, he delivered unto you first of all that which he received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's a major tenet of the gospel. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He also talks about the fact that he was buried which he was, and that he rose again the third day, which he did, and that that resurrection, as we're going to see in, in a little bit, is one of the seals that Christ was in fact the Christ. If, had he not been the Christ, he wouldn't have raised him, he wouldn't have been raised from the dead. The fact that the tomb was empty is the testimony that he was in fact the Christ, or is in fact the Christ. That's the testimony. Now, Paul, he also then argues and names names of some of the people that saw Christ after he was risen. He's giving historical evidence of people that you could go back and talk to. In fact, he says here, after that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain in this present. At the time Paul wrote this, you could go talk to those people and say, did you see him? Is this true? They were still around for many years after the fact. They were there and able to testify of it. After that he was seen of James and of all the apostles. So he's talking about the eyewitnesses that saw Christ being risen. And this is a, a major declaration. The fact that Christ was raised from the dead argues that we will be raised also. That's why Paul made that argument in, in another place, that if in this life only we have hope, then we are most men most miserable. If Christ be not risen, then we won't raise, but since he was raised, we will be raised as well. Look at verses 12 through 23. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? You see, there, were, there are people still to this day that will claim that there is no resurrection, you die, you turn into dust, that's it, it's over with. Well, if Christ was raised, doesn't that prove that there is a resurrection? Doesn't that show that God's able to raise the dead if he raised Christ? Well, of course it does. If Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain? 
Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, who he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. Do you see the argument? you see what Paul's saying? Here these ministers are out preaching that Christ rose from the dead, but if there is no resurrection and he didn't rise from the dead, we're liars. We're false witnesses of God. For if the dead rise not, then is, Christ, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins. You see, by raising Christ, that proves that the payment that Christ made on the cross was sufficient to pay for all the sins of his people. That was the seal that the sacrifice was accepted by God. Had it not been accepted, then we're all still in our sins and Christ is still in the ground. But the point is that since he was raised, that is evidence that the sacrifice was accepted by God. And there were all these witnesses that had seen him. And to this day, there's an empty tomb. No one's ever been able to present a body. How can you come up? Why wouldn't you come up with a body? There's all kinds of arguments about how they think that these disciples stole it. Well, I don't know how in the world they could. Do you think that a band of us could take on the 101st Airborne Division and, and grab their land away from them? Because that's about, how, that's about what it would have amounted to. A bunch of misfits trying to take on the military at the time. That's what you're looking at. These Roman centurions and these guards that were standing guard at that tomb were not kindergartners. And it was their job to make sure and maintain that tomb. And if, the, if anything happened to that tomb, they would pay for it with their lives. There was no way that these disciples that had run and hid and were cowering in the corners could have ever taken on those, that Roman legion. Couldn't have happened. And yet the tomb was empty. And they've never been able to present a body. And that's Paul's argument here. That since Christ was raised, then that argues that we will be raised as well. That God said that Christ would be raised and he was. He was telling the truth. So when he says that we will be raised, he is also telling the truth. Okay? This is his argument. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perishing. This, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. And that's the verse that I've been referring to. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Okay, so this is a major declaration of the gospel. And what Christ has done in history, it has consequences in the, in the end of history. The future resurrection of the dead and the judgment are part of the gospel as necessary conclusions of it. In Acts chapter 10... Acts chapter 10 and verse 40. Referring to Christ, says him God raised up the third day and showed him open showed him openly not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be judge of the quick and of the dead. 
Acts chapter 17 and verse 31. It says, Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. And finally, Romans chapter 2. And verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the future resurrection of the dead and the judgment, they're part of the gospel, just like the past resurrection of Christ was part of the gospel. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. This is Christ speaking, and he says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. The point being that once we are raised again in this resurrection, we will be like Christ and will never die again, which is how he has conquered, how he's conquered death. You think about the people that were, there were people that were resurrected at the time of the um, crucifixion. We read about people that were... Re Lazarus. Lazarus was resurrected. But then he died again. People, those people that were resurrected at the crucifixion, they were resurrected, but they died again. At this resurrection, there will be no more death. Death will be destroyed. And so, at that resurrection... The things that are going that will occur, not only will we be raised, but there will be the judgment on the judgment on the earth and on the lost at the same time. Okay. Our faith in the coming resurrection of the saints is founded in the past death and resurrection of Christ. That's where we that's where we get the hope. The fact that Christ was killed, buried and raised again to never die again is where we get our hope in 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13 but I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. You see, at the second coming, there's a part of those other people that are already in heaven. Their spirits and their souls. Their bodies are still down here. So when he's making reference to bringing them with him, the parts that he's bringing with him are the parts that are there. And they will be united with the parts that are still here when they're caught up to meet him in the air. Okay? And, and the fact that Christ died and rose again, is where is, that's what we are banking on, that the future resurrection will take place for us. What Christ accomplished in his first coming prepared God's elect for the second coming. Does that make sense? Look at Romans chapter 5. Much more 
much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now think about the wrath that's going to come on this planet at the second coming of Christ. If you are one that is justified by the blood of Christ, you will be saved from that. You will be resurrected and caught up to greet him in the air. So you'll be saved from the wrath to come through him by being in Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now notice that that deliverance is in the past. Who delivered us? He, that happened already. So it's already a sure thing. He doesn't have to deliver us from that. It's already been done. It, it's a fait accompli. We've been delivered from that. And we will be caught out of here before it happens but it'll happen at the same time, on the same day. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. And verse 26. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. What will you be saved from then? In this life, you're saved from, you've been saved from the penalty of sin already. What will you be saved from at the end when he returns? The wrath that's going to be poured out on this earth. You see, that's another future salvation that will take place. You won't be one of those. And you'll be saved from being cast in the lake of fire. You'll be saved. There are many different phases along the, along the path that we walk. The only way we can know if we have that salvation in the future is if we walk with him now. If we walk in this life as Christians, that's the only assurance that we can have that when he returns, we will be one that's caught up to greet him in the air. That's the only way that we can know that in this life is if we do what we need to do to stay faithful to Christ. Now, in the view of the second coming, God commands repentance. I think I can finish this one section, and then, and then we can, we'll wrap up for today. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness, by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that he hath raised him from the dead. You think about John the Baptist. What was it that he was commanding people to do? To repent and believe the gospel. To repent means to affect oneself with contrition or regret for something done. To change one's mind with regard to past action or conduct through dissatisfaction with, its, or, uh, with it or with its results. To turn from one thing and go to another. To change your mind, to affect, your, to affect yourself. Only by means of repentance can we have assurance that we're the children of God and have escaped the wrath to come. It's the only way we can know. It's the only way we can have that assurance. 
Mark chapter 1 and verse 5. Mark chapter 1 and verse 5. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of a skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey, and preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I, after me the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I have indeed baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And what was it that he was preaching at the time? To repent. To repent and be baptized. And that is the only way that we can have any kind of assurance the, we are one of God's children. Turn to Luke chapter 3 and verse 7. And this is John the Baptist. When, uh, when people had come out to talk to him, he says in, in verse 7, then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You see, that's a major tenet of this. Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children of, unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And that's the way it will be at the end of time. The trees that did not bring forth good fruit, those that, that did not repent, will be cut down and cast into the lake of fire. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we, what shall we do then? He answered and said, saith unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none, and he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then came also publicans to be baptized, and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed to you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, What shall we do? And he said unto them, Do do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. Now you'd have to understand that the publicans were tax collectors, and they made their living by charging you more than you owed. It was kind of like the Longshoremen's Union. You got paid your wages plus whatever you could steal. And it was the same with the military. And so what he was telling them to do was repent and be just. Repent and be ethical. Repent and be honest. Bring forth the fruits of someone that is a Christian. Live your life in such a manner that you don't have to worry about someone pointing you out as being a hypocrite. Don't be a hypocrite. Do things honestly. Live your life that way. And repent from what you've been doing in the past that is not ethical, that is not appropriate. Now, it's also important to understand that repentance and faith are not the cause of your escaping the wrath to come. This is not a system whereby if you do this, you have earned your way out of trouble. They are the evidence of that. They're not the cause. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 points out where the cause comes from and it does not come from within or, or from us it is not something that we do in order to earn our way into this Ephesians 2 10 says for we are his workmanship referring to God we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them you see, we're God's workmanship, 
and we were created by him in Christ, not ourselves. And the good works that we do are things that he's ordained that we should do. Why should we do them? Well, one reason is so that we recognize the fact that we were created in Christ Jesus by him. If you're able to do the good works, well, then that's an evidence that you're a child of God. Many people can't. But your good works are not the cause of your escaping the wrath. They're the evidence of it. John, or 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 23. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment. And let's stop and think about this for a minute. How many churches are there, especially Baptist churches, that are going to, preachers are going to stand up today and say, sinner, there's nothing you can do, all you have to do is believe. Right? Nothing you can do, all you have to do is believe. And they will argue vehemently that you don't have to keep the law and you don't have to keep commandments to be saved. All you got to do is believe. Now look at this verse. And this is his commandment. Okay, you want to know what commandment keeping is? He's giving you one right now. This is a commandment. Now if I don't have to keep commandments to get saved eternally, all I have to do is believe. I want you to see how this thing, this verse meets itself coming. Because to believe is keeping commandments. It's living by the law. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. If you tell me I have to believe in Jesus Christ in order to be saved, in order to be born again, then I'm going to tell you that's salvation by commandment keeping. Because the verse says it. This is his commandment that we should believe on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. Keeping commandments does not get you saved eternally. It evidences that you are saved eternally. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. You see that? You see how if you have the ability to keep that commandment, that testifies that you're one of his, and if you're one of his, you have escaped from the wrath to come. Look at John chapter 5 and verse 24. John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. He that heareth, hears, present tense, right now you're hearing his word and believeth, that's present tense, you right now believe on him that sent him. It says you have everlasting life, that's present tense. At the same time you hear, and at the same time you, you believe, you have everlasting life. You already have it. You don't get it. It doesn't say that he that, that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me gets everlasting life or earns everlasting life, or receives everlasting life, it says you have everlasting life. And shall not come into condemnation. You won't have to suffer the wrath when he returns. But is past, present perfect tense, past completed action, the effects of which are being felt in the present, is past from death into life. So you see, the keeping of the commandments, the believing in Christ, that is not what earns eternal life for you. And that is not what saves you from the wrath. It's an evidence that you have eternal life. And as a result, you are saved from that wrath that will come. 
and you shall not come into condemnation. Look at Romans chapter 8. And verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. There's no fear of condemnation for those that are in Christ. If you're a believer in Christ, then just keep believing in Christ. And just keep walking according to the to the light that you have. There is no condemnation for you. John chapter 10 and verse 27. John 10 and verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. If he gave you eternal life, how long, how long is that? If he gave you eternal life, can it end? Can it end by anything that you do if it's eternal? If you have everlasting life, can you lose everlasting life? No, of course not. If you have eternal life, you have eternal life. You will live forever. That's what the verse is saying. And if you're one of God's, if you're one of Christ's children, you already have, you're in possession of eternal life, and you can't lose it. No man can pluck Look at what it says here. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Well, any man, that includes you. How could you do anything to pluck yourself out of his hand? You can't. You should have no fear if you're a believer in Christ, if you're one of his children, if you have the evidences in your life to show that you are a child of God, you have no fear of any condemnation coming from God, and you have no fear of the second coming. It should be the most glorious event that you could ever imagine, because things only get good once that happens. The bad will be behind you. And understand that the cause of your escaping the wrath to come is God's election of you, Christ's death for you, the Holy Spirit's regeneration of you. For, turn first to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Verses 9 and 10. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Referring to God's elect. He's not appointed us to wrath. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us that whether we wake or sleep we should live together with him. You see, we're not appointed to wrath. We're appointed to salvation. If you're one of Christ's, look also at Titus chapter 3. Verses 4 through 7. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, not by commandment keeping, not by any type of works, any type of system that you have to do something in order to get it. Not at all. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. You see, it was God's choice. It was God's election of you to begin with. It was the death of Christ on the cross. It was the regeneration by the Holy Spirit that saves you from the wrath to come. Nothing that you did to earn it. Nothing, and if there's nothing that you did to earn it, there's nothing you can do to lose it. If you are one of Christ's children, you will remain one of Christ's children forever.
But the only assurance that you can have is if you continue to hold on. That's the only way we have any assurance of it. Look at Romans chapter 2 and we'll look at the other side of the equation again briefly. Romans chapter 2 verse 4. Let's look at verse 3 to get the context. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do things and which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds. And finally for this morning I want you to turn to 2 Timothy. You see we have a picture here of two groups of people and two different events happening at the same time. On the one hand you have the children of God that at this, at this point in time when Christ returns will be caught up out of this world never to fear, never to have pain again. And we have those that are not that will suffer the wrath of God not only on that day when he returns but for eternity thereafter. Okay. The devil doesn't like this doctrine, and there's a very good reason why he doesn't like this doctrine, because this is the, this is the doctrine that gives you the power to get away from him and to not have to listen to him and deal with him anymore. And believe me, you have that power, whether you know it or not. When he's whispering into your ear and causing fear, that's not God. God doesn't cause fear, and fear is the opposite of faith. So when someone's whispering into your ear causing fear, you need to know who that is. And there's something that you need to do about it. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, this is very important. 2 Timothy 2, verse 24. And we will close on this point. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Have you ever met anybody that opposed themselves? Have you ever been someone that opposed yourself? That part of you thought one thing and the other part of you thought something else? That you struggled with whether or not I can do this or I can't? Will I be in trouble with God if I do this or will I not? Do I really believe this or do I not? Am I really a child of God or am I not? Someone that opposes themselves. That's who it is that we are to try to witness to. Those are the people that we are supposed to try to talk to in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Remember, I'm not going to have you turn to the passage, but you remember the passage over in, in, Thessalon in one of the letters to the Thessalonians where Paul said, pray to be delivered from wicked men for all men have not faith? This is the contrast to this. People that oppose themselves. People that argue within themselves. They can see one side and they can see the other and, they're, and they're, they're not sure which way to go. These are the people that we are to try to witness to. When you find someone in this category, this is who you witness to. This is good ground. When you find someone that just puts up the walls and doesn't want to talk to you, well then don't talk to them. But when you find somebody that, that is in this situation, and I know every one of you have been there at one time or another, so you know what I'm talking about. Okay, In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Now watch this. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. You see, that repentance comes from God. That doesn't even come from you. 
And so when you witness to someone that opposes themselves and you spend time in prayer that if this is one of your children, let my, let my words have effect and God please grant them repentance that they can acknowledge the truth. That's our duty as children of God. Now it's specifically addressed to ministers, but it's also addressed to you as well, that when you're witnessing to someone, keep this in mind, because this is important. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Now watch what happens. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who were taken captive by him at his will. You see what happens when someone repents? They're taken out of the snare of the devil. The devil loses them. And that's why he fights so hard to hang on to them. So I hope this has been helpful to you. We will pick this up again next week. We're, we're not making very good head. This might turn into an Elijah by the time we're all said and done. I thought I'd be almost, I'm going to have to call Brother Dave in Arcadia and ask for some more openings for the videos because I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm going to finish next week. I'm on page four and it's an eight page outline. So we're maybe halfway through it, maybe two more. So with that, I thank you for your kind and patient attention. Let's, uh, let's stand. And before we dismiss, go ahead and shut that off. Before we dismiss.